Hello, my name is Tracy Johnson from cheeseneeds.com and learn to make cheese on Facebook. And today we're going to make gorgonzola dolce two different ways. To start with, I'm going to assume that you know how to sanitize all of your equipment. If you don't, I do have another video on my YouTube. You should go and check that out first. I say this because the majority of people trying blue cheese, it's not going to be your first cheese. It's going to be a progression of cheeses. You've made several cheeses already. You have a rough idea how curd work and you know how important it is to sanitize your equipment first. So we're just going to sanitize everything, including the necks of these bottles. I'm using four liters of 3.25% homogenized pasteurized milk from the store. You will need four liters of milk. You can use pasteurized homogenized from the store or you can use raw milk. A sixteenth of a teaspoon of Floralac from Codexing or an eighth of a teaspoon of other Flora Danica. A quarter of a teaspoon of rennet, single strength. A quarter of a teaspoon of calcium chloride. And your choice of Penicillium Roque Fortii inoculant. You can either harvest some from cheese or you can use powdered freeze-dried Penicillium Roque Fortii. I intend to use both. Because I'm going to be running a bit of an experiment here, I've got two jugs of milk from the same batch number, bought on the same day at the same place. I'm going to make sure everything is identical except for the one variable, which is the culture that we'll be using. So this pot, we're going to be using some harvested Penicillium Roque Fortii from a block of Gorgonzola. This pot, we're going to be using freeze-dried Penicillium Roque Fortii cultures from Codexy. We're going to see what the difference in progression of mould is between harvested and cultured. Uh, there won't be any other differences in the variables. All of the other ingredients are going to be identical. Remember to place your spoons face down so that the star sand will drain out of them. Before I begin, I'm going to be adding two drops of annatto to each pot. This doesn't add any flavouring, but it does add some colouring. If you're using annatto, it will get all over you, just bear that in mind. So I'm going to stir in the annatto and then heat the milk to 32 degrees C or 90 F. I'm also going to be adding Nutrilac to both of these cheeses. One sixteenth of a teaspoon of Nutrilac is enough to neutralize the lactose content of four liters of milk. So it turns it from lactose into dextrose, which is safe for most people who have lactose intolerance issues. If that's you or someone that you know, Nutrilac can be a godsend because it can put cheese, milk, yogurt, ice cream, all back on the menu. Obviously speak to your doctor first. Now to prepare the Penicillium Rook Fortio that I'm harvesting, I'm taking a brand new piece of Gorgonzola cheese that I've just opened today. You'll notice there's some missing. Yes, that's because you should always test it. There's no point propagating a cheese you don't like. So I've taken a good chunk of that, probably around a square inch, and I am squishing it into some 90 degree milk. So I've heated two cups of milk to 90 degrees, and for the next hour, I'm going to be stirring and allowing this to sit and it will become a mother culture. I will then take a quarter of a cup and the rest of it will be frozen for later use. This is how you culture from cheeses. One quick note about annatto is if you're adding calcium chloride to the milk because it's store-bought, pasteurized, homogenized, it's a good idea to add the annatto at one end of the process and the calcium chloride at the other end of the process. Everything goes in before the rennet, obviously, but if you add those two ingredients together, the calcium chloride does something to the annatto and you'll end up with freckles. You should keep a close eye on the temperature. You would think that two pots, the same size, roughly the same shape, with the same amount of milk in it at the same temperature, would both get to 90 degrees at the same time. No. 
Remember, if you're trying to change the temperature of your milk, you should stir it. If you want it to stay the same, you should leave it still. So my harvested penicillium rope 40 i from Gorgonzola has been sitting in this 90-ish degree milk uh, for exactly one hour now. So I'm going to take a quarter of a cup of this to inoculate my milk with, and the rest of this I will freeze in quarter cup sections. I have a silicone muffin tray that I use for this purpose specifically, and it works great for me. So in these pots, I have got 60 mils or a quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. This is bottled water. You can use tap water that's been boiled. Um, we're going to add the calcium chloride. So we need to add a quarter of a teaspoon of calcium chloride to this water, which we'll then add to each of these pots. So the homogenization process, they bash the fat molecules and that disperses them equally throughout the milk, which is why you don't get a cream line. So the calcium chloride is there to kind of help gather those back together again so that the rennet can do its job. So I'm adding a quarter of a teaspoon of calcium chloride in a quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water and I'm just going to mix that in. Now it's time to add the cultures. We have our milk at temperature, we have our anato in there, we have our calcium chloride in there. So we need to add Floralac or Floridanica to both of these pots. Now I'm using freeze-dried Floralac from Codex Inc. This is the company that I work with. So if it says in the recipe to use an eighth, you would use one sixteenth. So I'm going to add one sixteenth of Floralac if you're using standard Floridanica from any of the other culture houses, you'll need to add one eighth. Make sure it's a level spoon. You don't want this heat. And you want to try and sprinkle it over the top of the milk because it's a powder, it will have a tendency to clump. I'm using a 32nd of a teaspoon of Penicillium Rogue 40i because this is concentrated culture. So if you're using Pen Rogue from anybody else, then you would need to use 1 16th of a teaspoon. I'm going to leave these powders to rehydrate whilst I give this another stir. So this has been sitting for an hour now. The Penicillium Rogue 40i has melted into it. I'm going to take a quarter of a cup of this and I'm going to add that to the milk with the Floralac in it. Obviously sanitize your cup measure inside and out because you're dumping the entire thing in. And we've got some bits left. Just gonna scrape that in as well. So we can now stir these cultures in. So we've now mixed the cultures in and we're going to leave those to ripen for one hour. Now that the cultures are in, I'm going to add a sixteenth of a teaspoon of Neutralac to each pot so that these cheeses will be lactose free. At this stage you'll see there's not really an awful lot of difference between the harvested culture batch and the culture from a packet batch. So now my pot's been sitting for an hour, I've given them a quick stir, I've checked the temperatures, we're still around the 90 mark. I'm going to add a quarter of a teaspoon of regular rennet, or if you're using double strength like me, you're going to use an eighth of a teaspoon. Now we're checking for a clean break. Since I have one, I'm going to go around the pot and cut into one inch columns. We're then going to allow the pot to heal for 10 minutes. So we looked for a clean break at 30 minutes and there wasn't one. I looked again at 45 minutes and it was just fine. So after the cutting occurred, I let them heal for 10 minutes and now I've done one slow stir. We are now going to stir these over the next 15 minutes every couple of minutes. Not continuously because we don't want them to lose too much whey, but we do want them to lose some whey. If you find any very large curds, you can just cut them with the corner of your spoon.
At this stage, we're stirring the curd because we don't want them to mat together. So just a little stir, nice and gentle, every couple of minutes for 15 to 20 minutes. Now we're going to treat both pots exactly the same. We're going to draw off as much of the whey as we can. So we've stirred the cheese for an extra 10 minutes since we dipped off the whey. We're now going to slowly ladle this into a cheesecloth lined colander and let it free drain for 20 minutes. Now we do the same with the other pot. Here I'm checking if the curd have drained properly. There's still a lot of whey pouring out of this, so it's not ready to go in the mold yet. Okay, so I had these covered up so that they could steam over their own whey using clean tea cloths, obviously. Now I'm going to touch the cheese, so I've removed all of my jewellery and cleaned my hands and I've just re-sprayed those down. So I've been standing this curd in the mould. Oh, no, there's still free draining liquid. So it's got to go back. Yeah, these aren't dry enough yet. Come back later. Right, this has now been steaming over its own way for just over an hour. So I'm going to break the pieces up. It naturally wants to form into a block. I'm going to break the curd up. It's still very moist at this stage. And wash hands between each one, obviously. So we've loosely packed the curd into the mold. Any that have fallen into the colander can just be scooped in. And leave it to drain like this for a further two hours. After two hours, you'll notice it's lost a lot of height and it's sitting a lot lower in the basket. This is perfect. We'll end up with about half of this basket full. I'm just covering it with their cheesecloths just in case there's any flies. Now this is the fun bit. 
Now I have to take this cheese out and turn it over. Because it's a blue cheese, we want there to be air holes. We haven't consolidated this curd, so it could just fall to pieces. That's actually quite a good curd set, considering. We want it to be craggy. We want there to be air holes. Quite happy with that one. So I'm squeezing the edges of the mold to try and get the cheese to just let go a tiny bit. That one seems to have formed quite well as well. Good morning. Oh boy, it was last night a doozy. Okay, so instead of two hours in the mold, flip halfway through, two hours, then salt. It was two hours in the mold, flip halfway through, four hours, then salt, because my dogs ran away. Life happens, people. So I weighed out the salt per cheese. I've got two separate bowls so they don't get mixed up. And this has been sitting overnight. The top has been salted, but the bottom hasn't. You might notice that it's rounded in a little bit. It will do that in the mold, don't worry. So we're gonna pop that back in there. I'm going to take another quarter or so of the salt and then scatter it across the top. Remember, this is our cultured batch. This is our harvested batch. This one doesn't have as good integrity. Doesn't seem to be sticking together as well. So another quarter of this salt. Now what the salt is doing is it's slowing down the acidification of the cheese. It looks like a really lot of salt, and it is. This is two and a half percent salt. So if you've ever found blue cheese really salty, that's probably why. So I've salted and turned these last night. I've salted and turned them again today. I'll do it again tonight and again tomorrow morning and then they will go into my cave. I have a specific igloo that I keep just for blue cheeses. So I will show you that setup in just a little bit. Okay, so this is my blue cave. I don't like to put blues in my regular cave because they do contaminate everything. So I have an igloo which is just for blue cheeses. I change out the foil at the bottom uh, every time I use it because obviously this, this thing is porous. So, um, I don't want any kind of cross-contamination or anything like that. So changing out the ice pack, which is underneath here every single day in this room that I'm keeping it in my basement is enough to keep this box at 12 degrees, which is perfect for aging this blue cheese. Uh, we will be back in about a week. I will give you updates, photos and videos on the Facebook group. How do I know which is which? Written on the top. Thank you for playing along and I look forward to seeing your cheeses. Okay, so it's the morning of day three. We have the cultured cheese here. We have the harvested cheese here. I know this because I have it written on the roof and I change out this bag every day. Once a day, change that bag out. This will keep this at around about 12 degrees C. At the moment, it's rocking 14 because I've got the door wide open. Okay, so this is my blue cave. I don't like to put blues in my regular cave because they do contaminate everything. So I have an igloo, which is just for blue cheeses. I change out the foil at the bottom uh, every time I use it because obviously this, this thing is porous. So um, I don't want any kind of cross contamination or anything like that. So changing out the ice pack, which is underneath here every single day. In this room that I'm keeping it in my basement is enough to keep this box at 12 degrees, which is perfect for aging this blue cheese. Uh, we will be back in about a week. I will give you updates, photos and videos on the Facebook group. Thank you for playing along and I look forward to seeing your cheeses. How do I know which is which? Written on the top. How do I know which is which? I wrote it on the top. Mm. 
But it's now time to wrap these gorgonzola. They've been pierced. They've been sitting in the egg blue at 12 degrees C this whole time. So we're going shiny side up for the paper. We're going to star sand our hands. We're only touching with fingertips, so I don't really feel the need to take my rings off. There's quite a bit of give already. This is the harvested one. So we're just going to pull the, the foil up and then try and tuck it in kind of like a gift. And frankly, this is a gift. Keep going round and round the circle until the whole thing is covered in the tin foil. And then just give it a bit of a pat down. Try and squidge it in a little bit so that there's contact with the tin foil. You want as little air as possible in there so that the outside mold doesn't continue to develop. Now we're going to carefully label our cheese. Because I've made both of these on the same day and I've made them differently, I want to make sure I know by looking at it which is which. So this is the Gorg Dolce Jan 8th Harvested. And then we do the same thing for the Gork Dolce, Jan 8, Cultured. And through the magic of YouTube, uh, we have now jumped forward 11 weeks. That's nearly three months. Nearly, not quite. So here we are opening up the cheese. It's time to cut it. It's time to look at it. And it's time to give it a taste test. So I'm going into the harvested cheese first. If you remember, I smushed up some existing cheese in warm milk and let that culture for an hour. Um, then I mix that into my milk. This is a um, reasonably soft paste. Hoping for some veining. Yay, there's veining. peek a -boo. All right, let's open this up. It is quite soft. There is definitely some give to it. Oh, lovely veining. You can see there's some softness to the paste. It started to break down and go gooey. There's a definite cream line in through the center and the paste is slightly firmer to the outside. Just a little nibble. Oh, that is smooth, that is creamy. The salt level is quite high, but it's supposed to be. That's perfect for a Gorgonzola Dolce. Remember that one was the one that was harvest culture. This one is the one that used packet culture. Now you can see there is a big difference in the um, in the breakdown of the paste. It's much softer. It's much gooier, more unctuous. There's a, a dent in the paste on the top. Much less veining on this one, but there are crumbles of um, softness. So closer to a Cambazola. Very runny, very, very high moisture content on this one. That's perfect. Okay, flavor-wise, the store-bought culture one had a lot more flavor to it, but a much less veining. Uh, it was much softer. You'll see the harvested one is much firmer. 
I wouldn't leave either of these alone if they were on a cheese board in front of me. They're both very, very good. So the jury's out on whether it's better to harvest or to buy your cultures. Um, not easy for me to say that, given that I sell cultures, but the harvested one is still very, very good. So uh, thank you so much for watching. This is one of my longest videos thus far. If you've liked it, please like it. And if you could subscribe, I would appreciate it. I'm Tracy from Cheese Needs and from Learn to Make Cheese.